basically uh, two sides. On one side there was the beaches, on the other side there was miles and miles of agriculture. So you had bikinis on one side and swamps on the other. A lot of people referred to, to Vero as Zero Beach because it uh, was a small community. However, the afternoon of the 26th of July, 1983, would send shockwaves through the tranquil seaside community. Teenage friends, Lynn Elliott and Reagan Martin, were planning a day out. Lynn was a beautiful young woman, smart. She was getting ready to graduate from high school. She was passionate about her friends. She just had uh, several nice friends, and they used to come by the house. Reagan was a, a new friend. They would have fun, and you could hear them laughing. We only lived two blocks from the beach, so they were, they were over there almost every day. Uh, my son Brian and uh, my son Jason and, and Lynn were over there, and we didn't worry about them then. You let them go, they come back, you tell them when to come back, and that's it. I got back about 5 o'clock, and uh, Brian was there, and, and uh, I asked Brian, I said, well, where is Lynn? He says, well, she was at the beach with us, and she and Reagan were out there standing out there hitchhiking, and I told them not to do it. The young girl's decision to hitch a ride gave Carl great cause for concern. And I said, well, I'm beginning to worry. It was like 5 o'clock then, you know? And uh, I said, she should be home. That same afternoon, a teenage boy was on his way home from a friend's house when he witnessed a disturbing scene. I heard this screaming, and this man was chasing this young girl, or lady. Then I saw him dragging her back towards the house, and I heard two shots. This sinister sighting would be the climax of a twisted tale that had begun in mysterious circumstances two years earlier. The Ling family had recently moved to Vero Beach, emigrating from their native Taiwan. Working in one of the many orange groves in the town, the father, Pu Ling, was befriended by Vero local Robert Lindsay. Pu Ling was just the kind of person that you couldn't help but like the daughter, whose name was Inghua, was just as sweet as she could be and uh, an honor student in math. But on the 19th of February, 1981, 17-year-old Inghua and her mother, Shang Huang, suddenly disappeared from their home. We contacted everybody that, that knew Pu Lang, and we had 20, 30 people just friends and family out, out looking. But the, the problem was we really didn't know where to look. It was like a needle in a haystack. Detective Phil Redstone received a call alerting him to the troubling mystery. Uh, we did an inspection of the house and found all the personal property, purse of the mother uh, located on a table just inside the door a vacuum cleaner that was right inside the front door that was still plugged into the wall, looked like someone was vacuuming the house at the time, and left it right in the middle of the uh, walk area. No signs of a struggle uh, or any kind of uh, anything disturbed in the house that was out of the ordinary. Frustratingly, Detective Redstone had very little evidence to work with. There wasn't another house within uh, a mile of where they lived, uh, so there was no witnesses at all that had seen anything. Uh, so as far as having any suspects, I mean, we were completely in the dark. Yet the Lings would not be the last women to vanish. 
the predator hunting women in Vero Beach had only just begun. In 1981, the disappearance of mother and daughter, Shang and Ying Hua Ling, would disturb the peace in the rural Florida town of Vero Beach. It really unnerved the community, and the, it, it just seemed unlikely that anything but foul play had happened. It gets frustrating as time goes by, and then you're having nothing to work on, and then you're kind of in, in the situation where, is this an isolated incident, or is something else going to happen? Six months later, detectives' fears were realized as they faced another mystery. Judy K. Daly was the Fort Pierce resident who had grown up around here and had relocated out to California. So she was here visiting family. She had taken her two daughters to a nearby beach and dropped them off. It was real popular with teenagers. You know, it wasn't really a place that parents liked to hang out. She went to a more secluded area of the beach to hang out by herself. And then she just disappeared. Phil Redstone would again be called to begin an investigation. When the officers first arrived, they found uh, the car parked over uh, to the side by itself, no other vehicles in the park. Uh, the officers uh, you know, checked the vehicle to make sure that there was uh, no occupants, checked the uh, beach area, see if there was anyone on the beach or anyone that might be uh, a witness to uh, uh, Judy K. Daly being here. However, indications of foul play soon became apparent. No one had seen her. There was no evidence of any of her uh, blankets, personal items, or anything else on the beach. Uh, only the vehicle uh, in, in the parking lot. Uh, we decided to uh, take the vehicle into uh, custody and impound the vehicle and uh, noticed when the vehicle had been uh, altered uh, to prevent it from being started. Working in the orange groves near the sites of both disappearances was David Gore, a 27-year-old local man who was watching the unfolding investigation with interest. David Gore was a native of the Vero Beach area. His parents, Alva and Velma, seemed to have a very nat normal childhood. He grew up with a sister. Father was a hard-working man, had a good reputation around town. David's father uh, became a citrus manager in, in the citrus industry. At that point in time, there wasn't a whole lot to do between uh, growing up in Vero Beach, your family either got involved in the citrus industry or got involved in some kind of service industry. So David was quite familiar with the citrus groves and, and the, the swamps and the different areas of Vero Beach. While the Gore family were prominent members of the local community, their outward appearance disguised peculiar behaviors at home. His mother used to read the Bible to him all the time. Uh, although it was strange how she did, she would uh, set him on her lap when she had, the only thing she had on were her panties and bra, and she would read the Bible to him. As he grew older, David would form a powerful bond with his cousin, Fred Waterfield. They were first cousins, but uh, they were more like brothers. They hung around a lot. He looked to Fred as a mentor and kind of mimicked a lot of his uh, behavior. Phil Williams recalls the days he spent with Gore at high school. David was always a real laid back type of person. Uh, and during those days, we did a lot of hunting. David knew all the good hunting areas. He knew all the areas where uh, you could have a lot of undisturbed activities. Uh, in other words, there wasn't anybody going to catch you doing what you were doing. Uh, and David knew several isolated areas like that. Gore's cousin, Fred Waterfield, often joined the hunt. Myself and Freddie and David uh, went and did a lot of wild game, mostly rabbit hunting in the, in the groves and different things like that, quails. Um, and. Uh, it was pretty innocent. 
In high school, Waterfield was a leader, while Gore would typically follow. Freddie, it seemed like, was always planning something. Freddie liked to go and uh, chase vehicles and uh, throw grapefruits at the window and then have the uh, owners turn around and chase them down. What he called it was fun. In order for Freddie to be having fun, uh, the, the feelings of the other person weren't necessarily necessary to be good ones. The pair quickly realized that they shared a twisted interest. It seems that these two had a, a secret hidden perversion between the two of them that they discovered amongst each other at a very early age. As teenagers, they were looking at his sister and her body, looking at Fred's mother, and uh, uh, I think she had a sheer blouse on one time. And they were both commenting on, you know, uh, the arousal that they got from looking at that. And they both realized at an early age that they kind of had a little bit of a, a deviant uh, appetite for sexual activity. By age 18, Gore and Waterfield's desire to explore the darker side of sex could no longer be contained. One of the first sexual encounters that the two of them did together was assaulting David's sister. And I believe she was about 16 years old when this happened, and David held her down while Fred raped her. It's very likely that they turned to a family member because they, they believed they could easily control her. Gore and Waterfield were close, fast, um, and, and particularly intimate in their, in their closeness. So they probably shared fantasies, sexual fantasies. They probably experimented with various things and then eventually decided to assault one of their, their family members. So she was kind of the sacrificial lamb. The pair would continue to delve deeper into the fantasies they shared, strengthening the sadistic bond they had built. In 1976, Angela Hamel claims she called on her mechanic, Fred Waterfield, to help her with some flat tires. Yet instead of taking her to his repair shop, she said he headed deep into the orange groves where David Gore was lying in wait. David didn't really speak much. He just looked, he had this stare, like evil look and creepy. They both looked at me and they started to laugh, but their eyes, it was kind of like they had an undisclosed power connection. That's when David said, okay, we're ready to do this now. And Fred just looked and he was like getting worked up, like he enjoyed this. That's when Fred grabbed me, and he reached over into the glove compartment. That's for the first time when I saw a gun. Angela recalls that both Gore and Waterfield then repeatedly raped her. The next thing I felt was something cold on my body. It was a knife. David said, okay, we'll cut her up and feed her to the alligators. And that's when Fred looked, still was the gun in his hand, David was the knife, and David was totally confused. He acted like that part wasn't rehearsed or something. Angela claims she was ultimately driven home and sworn to secrecy. I guess there was a reason God didn't let me die, that I didn't get killed. You know, I'm grateful for it. I still don't know the reason, but um, I'm thankful. And I thank God every day. Five years later, in 1981, three women would mysteriously go missing in Vero Beach. Four months after the Lings had vanished, 
Auxiliary Sheriff's Deputy David Gore became a suspect in their disappearance. After carrying out an unauthorized and highly suspicious traffic stop on an 18-year-old girl. He told her that there had been a robbery in the neighborhood and her car matched the description of a possible uh, suspect. So he took her driver's license and asked her to follow him to a location so someone could identify her car. When he got down to this isolated road, there was a gentleman down there that was fishing. So he goes back to the girl in the car and said, I just got a radio call and uh, they located the suspect and you're free to go. Based on the circumstances of him making a traffic stop, and taking this girl into an isolated area, it would lead you to believe that he was trying to kidnap someone or take them from against their will. Gore was subsequently fired from the sheriff's department, but his former colleagues would continue to keep a keen eye on him. Now we're starting to look at him, you know, what, what is his involvement? We're starting to see him around and uh, starting to become more aware of his presence. As detectives worked to connect Gore with the cases of the missing women, his actions would continue to draw their attention. Marilyn Owens was uh, parked here and was uh, going to see her family physician. Uh, went into the doctor's office, was returning to her car in the parking lot. And when she was uh, walking up to the car, she noticed a head bob up from the back seat. At the same time, one of our deputies was also here at the same doctor's office. Uh, as Marilyn Owen stopped our police officer and told her that uh, there was someone hiding out in the back seat of her car. The officer found David Gore hiding in the back seat with his shirt off, had an alcoholic beverage in his hand. Uh, he also had a handgun, a police scanner, and also handcuffs with him in the back seat of the car. Charged with attempted kidnap and taken into custody, investigators now look to link David Gore to the still unsolved Ling and Daly cases. We had uh, obtained a warrant to um, taken to uh, possession his vehicle and the uh, forensic uh, search of the vehicle revealed that there was some hair and fibers that were able to link to the uh, Ling case. The evidence appeared damning would not be enough to thoroughly. prove his involvement beyond all reasonable doubt. You're almost sure that he's the, the one that's responsible. And if you can't arrest him, you know this, it's just a matter of time till he does it again. If you don't have the evidence, you can't just make up a case and just arrest him on suspicion. You need to be able to tie it all together. Ultimately, Gore was convicted of trespass against Marilyn Owens and handed a five-year sentence. David Gore's difficulties in approaching the opposite sex had been evident since his days at high school. bashful and more or less kind of a rednecky and never really showed that much interest in girls. Uh, the one girlfriend that he did have uh, actually at one point in time then decided that uh, she would rather be with me and uh, started then dating me because she said that uh, David was like a good friend and he was not he had no inspiration to ever even try to kiss her or do anything along that line. In complete contrast, David's cousin, Fred Waterfield, was a prolific ladies' man. Fred was very popular in high school. 
He was a very athletic guy, very tall, good looking. He really liked the girls. The girls liked him. Uh, he had a very easygoing personality. It was a lot more assertive. Freddie was always after girls. Always dating, always, uh, you know, always had a uh, female on his mind and always had a way to um, get one. I think that, that Freddie's domineering personality uh, at some point in time and his um, constant success with the girls and constant uh, probably played a part in, in, in David uh, David's desires developing into the state that they did. Gore may have actually been jealous of Waterfield. Waterfield was a fairly popular adolescent, not Gore. Gore was a kind of a weird and unusual guy who was not popular, but Waterfield was. And there may have been an underlying jealousy of Gore towards Waterfield. Later in life, Gore's repeated rejections would fuel his aggressive pursuit of women, made evident in his attempt to kidnap Marilyn Owens. Having served just 18 months in prison, David Gore was set to be released. The residents of Vero Beach were about to face his wrath once more. Following the attempted kidnap of Vero Beach resident Marilyn Owens in 1981, David Gore had been imprisoned for 18 months. However, police had also suspected his involvement in the disappearance of three local women. And as the end of his prison term approached, detectives were preparing themselves for his release. We uh, received notification from the state prison system that he was going to be released within 30 days. So we had a, a heads up that he was getting ready to come back in the community. So we uh, decided to set up some surveillance uh, on David once he was released to kind of monitor his activities. But again, we knew that sooner or later something else was going to happen. This was not going to stop. The afternoon of the 26th of July, 1983, when Lynn Elliott and Reagan Martin failed to return home from the beach, Lynn's father grew increasingly worried. I talked to my son, Brian, and I says, she should be home. He says, I told him, Dad, not to do it. That, that was a terrible, terrible feeling. That same day, Detective Phil Redstone decided to conduct some surveillance. I just had this uh, sudden urge uh, uh, yeah, that I needed to get out of the office and I needed to go by David Gore's house. About halfway from the sheriff's office headquarters to the Gore house, I hear a call coming over the police radio where a young man riding his bicycle home from school had observed something. I knew who I was looking for. I knew where to go. The boy riding his bike had reported a sighting of a screaming girl being chased down by a man with a gun. Responding to the call, Phil Redstone arrived outside the family home of David Gore. When we first arrived at the scene, I arrived with two uniform officers. There's a three of us that arrived at the same time. Uh, we went down the driveway. Uh, and at that time, then we uh, surrounded the house and awaited for other units to arrive. Redstone was joined at the scene by Detective Williams. After hours of attempting negotiations, the pair of officers approached the property with caution. There were people behind every palm tree, so to speak, with a, uh, a gun trained on the house. I went to the... Uh, to the door of the garage. And I began yelling in, David, it's Phil, come on out, come on out, thinking that the friendship would maybe still have some meaning to it. As Phil Williams appealed to his former colleague to come quietly, his attention was drawn towards the car parked in the garage. I noticed blood dripping out of, a, uh, of, of the uh, vehicle that had obviously just been pulled into the driveway. We busted the trunk open, and there was a teenage female shot and tied up in the trunk of the vehicle. 
The body was that of Lynn Elliott. You never forget seeing something like that. And uh, shaking her and see if you can't get some life. You never forget that. Carl Elliott would soon learn the fate of his daughter, Lynn. I got a knock on the door. And it was a detective from the sheriff's department. And he had the bad news for me. Told me they had found her body in the trunk. And uh, it was just unbelievable. How could this happen to my daughter? Especially in a small town like Vero Beach. We felt safe there. And now all of a sudden, all that, all that is gone. That was actually for me the first time I realized that David was not the David that I grew up with. He was a monster. And uh, from there, the monster had to be stopped. As authorities closed in to make an arrest, they eventually found Gore hiding in the loft. To the surprise of authorities, he was not alone. I think he knew at that point there was uh, no way out. Uh, we were lucky and we were able to um, secure a uh, second victim. Gore's hostage was Reagan Martin, who had been hitchhiking from the beach with Lynn Elliott. When Reagan was rescued, she was hysterical. Uh, it was really difficult at first for her to tell them exactly what had happened. But, you know, she was able to piece it together. She said that they were taken to separate bedrooms and that Gore had raped the both of them. She said that she knew that Lynn was trying to escape. She heard the front door slam and that's when she uh, saw David run out of her room. And uh, Lynn was uh, running up that road the best she could, still being partially bound, David chasing her. And then he shot her about uh, three fourths the way up the driveway to the main road. And that's what the young man saw on his bicycle was David chasing a girl and then hearing the gunshots. While further recounting her ordeal, Reagan Martin stunned investigators with the revelation that David Gore had a partner in crime who had already fled the scene. She told police officers that David Gore had someone else with him. And she identified Fred Waterfield as being the man that drove the vehicle that took him to the house and also escorted them into the house and put them in separate bedrooms. Fred Waterfield was found at his auto repair shop, just half a mile from the Gore house. Phil Williams recalls his former classmate's behavior as he brought him in for questioning. During that ride, Freddie was almost visibly shaking and, and very, very nervous. And he, he became as though he was not there with me. He was focused on something he was thinking about very strongly. And uh, as a matter of fact, looking down the roadway, he said, if that son of a bitch gets me in trouble, I'll kill him. At the sheriff's department, Reagan Martin picked both Gore and Waterfield out of a lineup, identifying them as her attackers. Under questioning, David Gore would come forward with further admissions of guilt, confessing to the unsolved murders of the Lings and Judy K. Daly, of which he had long been suspected. The details of his entrapment of the Lings unmasked David Gore as a cold-blooded predator. He had been stalking uh, the teenage girl uh, for a couple of weeks. He did surveillance on the house and uh, found out that she was home alone for probably about 45 minutes. What David didn't know was that her mother now was coming into town for a holiday. When he uh, went to the house, he went and used his police badge. He had told uh, the mother and the daughter 
uh, that he needed to take them into questioning to the police department about something that happened in the neighborhood. And uh, then he had handcuffed them and put them in the truck. They were taken to a uh, shack out in the Grove area that he had access to. He called uh, Fred Waterfield, told them they had two women here, and uh, they had the activity they were looking for for the weekend. Gore would also explain how he disabled Judy Daly's car and then lay in wait before making his move. When she got in her car, car wouldn't start up. David said he got in his vehicle, drove over, showed him his badge and said, you know, could he offer any assistance if her car was broke down? And uh, she, you know, he, he tried to start, it wouldn't start, so he offered her to give her a ride. And uh, that's how he got her in the car. He pulls a gun on her and takes her out to the shack out in the you know, orange groves west of town. This wasn't just snatching somebody. These were thought through, planned abductions. Gore had a murder kit, brought it with him, and it shows the level of planning that was involved. These were not spontaneous, impulsive, spur-of-the-moment abductions and murders. They were done in a fairly sophisticated way. Gore claimed he was then joined by Waterfield while they carried out their crimes. Yet his apparent co-conspirator would strongly dispute the allegations. Fred Waterfield says that he was framed by David Gore, that he might have uh, known about some of these things, but he never participated in the murders, and that David lied repeatedly to make him look like a perpetrator when, in fact, he was not. Shockingly, Gore went on to reveal two more slayings, claiming he and Waterfield had kidnapped and murdered teenage hitchhikers Barbara Bayer and Angelica Lavalle. At this point in time, police knew that they had a stone-cold serial killer on their hands of the likes they had never seen in this region before. As the trial approached, David Gore took authorities to the groves where he had worked, promising to lead them to the bodies of his victims. I had ridden out there with Phil Rudstone, so we were in a particular area, and he, he had one of those metal probes in the ground, and he was probing around, and he hit something solid. So he took a brush and just brushed the dirt away. Looking at us was a set of teeth. The remains were that of Barbara Bayer. Over the following days, Gore would go on to disclose the gravesite locations of the other missing women. Initially in the Lings case, he said after they were uh, uh, murdered, he put them in 55-gallon drums buried them. Judy K. Daly, he had uh, dismembered her body, disposed again in another location in the grove, uh, part of her body. The other part of her body he disposed in the marshland out west of town. And uh, Miss LaValle uh, was disposed of in the marshland, uh, same place as uh, Judy K. Daly's uh, body was uh, dumped. I looked in his eyes while we were doing the digging. And I mean, I never saw a set of eyes like that. It looked like, I suppose, the eyes of the devil would look like. If you believe evil spirits could get in people, there's certainly one in him. Investigators would soon dig deeper into the minds of Gore and Waterfield, searching for an explanation behind the pair's desire for depravity. In 1983, David Gore and Fred Waterfield were arrested in connection with a string of mystery disappearances and brutal murders in the town of Vero Beach, Florida. While Waterfield pleaded his innocence, Gore confessed to the slayings of six women and in the process revealed the cousin's M.O. David was the bad guy and Fred was the good guy. And he would, Fred did most of the talking and he would try to get the girls calm but eventually, Gore would uh, use his bad guy routine and get them to go where they wanted them to go. To have sex with them till a certain point, then they would kill him. Phil Williams believes parallels could be drawn between their practice of trapping their victims and the way they hunted game as youngsters. Freddie would once tell me that he'd rather hunt with me because I like going after the game. 
David's hunting style was sort of boring. He would rather wait and for the game to come to him. What I was seeing at the Lynn Elliott abduction on the beach, uh, that was Freddie's hunting style. What I was seeing waiting at the Ling house is David's hunting style. Most sexual murder individuals commit murder alone. These are very personal things. These are very private things. They do it solo. Sometimes because of that, you'll see two different patterns of behavior at the crime scene. One somewhat sophisticated and a less sophisticated pattern of behavior as well. Although Waterfield had barely been on the investigator's radar, Gore claimed his cousin was in fact the ringleader. After Gore was caught, he talked about being the, the weak one. He was the compliant accomplice, according to his story. But his behavior tells another story. The fact that he ended up becoming an auxiliary officer indicates more dominant personality right off the bat. So I believe that they were co-equal to some extent, but that uh, Gore was truly a leader in the sadism. Despite gaining closure on these long unsolved cases, questions still remained about the origins of the cousin's evil. David Gore would look to his childhood to explain his desire for depravity. When he was a toddler, he fell into an ant bed and was bitten quite severely, particularly around his head and face. And they did have to uh, rush him to the doctors for treatment. And he developed a very high temperature and it burned his brain. And he was never quite right in the head after that. It seemed that he did change a bit after that incident so that probably he did have some neurological damage that affected his ability to make moral choices, to inhibit his behavior. Um, to, to be aggressive. I would say it's likely that that brain damage that he had was part of, of becoming a killer. And especially if you're in a, a team where the other guy wants to do it too, not only is your brain giving you permission, but you have a buddy who's also giving you permission. Phil Williams believes Fred Waterfield's apparent obsession with sex drove him to take women by force. Freddie was always after girls pretty much talked about girls all the time. I was always bragging about it, and was always trying to find ways to have more conquest. I've often have felt from the beginning that Freddie probably inspired this whole thing uh, in some way or shape or form. Stories would later emerge that suggested Gore's twisted desires may have had their beginnings in the fetishes he had once indulged in in private. There were rumors that came out of David's first wife that he was into bondage. I had a theory later on that that was David's worst enemy um, and, and that he was unable to express himself uh, with a girl uh, unless maybe she was tied up and gagged and, and had no personality to address him with. When combined, the fantasies of David Gore and Fred Waterfield would eventually prove to be the catalyst for their murder spree. If you have a couple of sadistic guys who hang out and get drunk, start talking about what they want to do to women, they probably made a pact that they um, were going to kind of live for each other, which is what it seemed like. That's a pretty volatile combination. So did David Gore and Fred Waterfield develop their taste in hunting human game? Or were they born with their murderous bond? My opinion, I think this had happened over a long period of time and the things we have in investigation, we have them involved in things going back 10 or 11 years before the time of, uh, that they were arrested in 1983, of being involved together. And again, the, the good guy and the bad guy, and the one would feed off the other and they had the sexual fantasies that continued to progress and get worse as time went on. I think that Freddie uh, was the stronger of the two personalities. Uh, I, I can't imagine uh, David doing anything without having been inspired in some way by Freddie. 
I've always felt like that the two personalities together is what made up the elements necessary for those crimes to flourish and become fruitful. Gore was a born killer because I do think it was an environmental thing. I think he had brain damage, neurological damage that probably influenced his, his um, aggression and inability to make moral decisions, as well as his association with a cousin with similar inclinations. Fred Waterfield was the stronger personality of the two of them, and I do believe that he had the ability to influence David Gore's behavior and to plant ideas in his head, and perhaps it was where uh, Fred learned this behavior, or maybe it was his environment, and he had these dark thoughts, and he knew he had Gore there to escalate it and turn it from fantasy to reality. At trial, Fred Waterfield continued to plead his innocence. However, faced with a positive identification by Reagan Martin and supporting physical evidence, he was eventually found guilty of the manslaughter of Lynn Elliott and the murders of Barbara Bayer and Angelica Lavalli. He would receive multiple life sentences. David Gore was sentenced to receive the death penalty. After almost three decades on death row, he was executed in 2012. While I was watching him die, I said to myself, I condemn your soul to hell. And I kept saying that in my mind. And I hope that is where it went. Although Lynn Elliott's life was lost at the hands of David Gore, her father, Carl, believes her spirit lives on. She loved this beach area. I can even talk to her here and it helps me. It just brings her back to me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we feel her presence here very much. <laughs>